morning, everybody. Welcome to Flyleaf, our ongoing discussion with uh, authors and friends of the North Carolina Office of Archives and History, and especially our publications office. I'm really glad to be joined today uh, by Dr. Darren Waters, who is uh, the new deputy secretary of the, well, new, uh, a relatively new addition to the Department of Natural and Cultural Resources, um, our agency here. Um, so Dr. Waters is the deputy secretary for the, our agency, is director for the Office of Archives and History. Um, he has a long list of additional titles, including Keeper of the Capitol, which is one of my favorites. But uh, uh, Darren, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, well, first, Joe, it, it's really good to be here with you. Um, glad to join all of you who are kind of watching this. Uh, we hope it will be entertaining. You know, I'm nobody special, um, but I am certainly honored and, and I feel privileged to be sitting in this position and working with, uh, with an incredible team of people here at the Department of uh, Natural and Cultural Resources in the Office of Archives and History. And I know Joe will talk a little bit more about that at some point. But um, I'm proud to say that I'm a native North Carolinian, born and raised. Um, I love the state. Um, I'm a big Tar Heel fan for those, you know, hopefully that didn't get me in trouble with too many people who are, are watching. Um, but uh, born and raised in Asheville, North Carolina. And many people find that, you know, uh, somewhat surprising, Joe, because, you know, my own um, research and um, and much of my work has centered on the African-American experience in, in the mountains of Western North Carolina and looking more broadly at the mountains of, uh, of Southern Appalachia as well. So, and part of the reason why I got involved in that work was because you know many people had this, uh, were under the uh, notion that there weren't many people of color living in the mountains of Western North Carolina. And my family, um, goes back at least until the 1850s in the region. So my great grandfather, who was George Waters, uh, lived in um, Henderson County at one point. Um, my great grandfather, Lewis Waters, uh, who was born in 1860, was born in Henderson County, lived there, owned an apple orchard in Edneyville. Some people will know that um, that little town right outside of Hendersonville, which is apple country. Um, part of the family still owns a part of that apple orchard that is there. So North Carolina is my home and, you know, educated here in the state of North Carolina, um, both at North Carolina State University and at, at Chapel Hill. Prior to that, I went to Liberty University in uh, Virginia, but, you know, came back home and spent, have spent most of my if not all of my professional life back here in, in North Carolina. So I'm proud to say I'm a native North Carolinian and proud to be back here in the state of North Carolina and in this position. Well, that's terrific. Um, can, you, can you tell us a little bit about your, um, uh, about your work before coming here to the Office of Archives and History? Yeah, it's, it's been, um, I guess what some people would say a very interesting path uh, to, <laughs> to, to this role. So I, I mentioned that I had gone to Liberty University and then once I left Virginia and came back to North Carolina, my first job was here in Raleigh. So I'm quite familiar with Raleigh. Raleigh in many ways feels like home because many people will say where your professional life begins um, really becomes home. Um, it, this is home for my two sons. My, I have two sons, Jonathan and Lewis. They were both were born here. But when I came back to the state of North Carolina in 1989, I first started working as a probation parole officer in the department. At the time, it was called the Department of Corrections. And uh, interesting job, interesting experience, experiences that I had there. One of the reasons why I took that job was because I was interested in going on to law school, like so many people were. Um, I, uh, that interest kind of faded uh, while I was in the position. It didn't have anything to do with the position per se. I just had a really good mentor uh, in a man named uh, Jay Parker, who is no longer with us, uh, but he just had a lot of foresight into my interest. And he started encouraging me to think about graduate school and pursuing my passion for history. And so I'm glad I listened to him, it worked out. I mean, one of the people that I had an opportunity to meet when I decided to, uh, 
to, you know, kind of give it a try to see if this is what I wanted to do. I mean, I first had a conversation with many of the, the viewers of this program will recognize the name John Hope Franklin. And um, I had the opportunity to get to know Dr. Franklin, had a conversation with him about my interest in going on to graduate school. He encouraged that. Uh, we ended up maintaining a very uh, long-term relationship um, over the course of my uh, career in graduate school. But I decided to you know, kind of take a stab at this at North Carolina State and enjoyed my time there. And one of the people that I got to know while I was at North Carolina State as one of my professors was uh, Dr. Jeffrey Crow. And so Dr. Crow, who was uh, prior to me two, um, two deputies ago, he was deputy secretary of the Office of Archives and History. So I'm following, I feel like I'm following in, in very big footsteps. And so I got to know Dr. Crow. Uh, Dr. Crow was with me through you know, my master's work, he actually was a part of uh, advising me through my doctoral program at Chapel Hill. So it's been a long relationship. And so, but that's kind of the trajectory. It, you know, started in probation and parole and then brought me in here. And, and one of the reasons why, Joe, I think that my time as a probation and parole officer was valuable to me is because it, it gave me a real good sense of what it means to engage a community, to work with people in the community doing the social work. So once I finished graduate school, I ended up going back to uh, Asheville because I wrote about Asheville for my dissertation. That took me back to Asheville. You know, I served as a, uh, as a professor in the history department at UNC Asheville, I was there for 10 years, also served on uh, two chancellor's uh, staffs there, um, overseeing the Office of Community Engagement. But what was important for me was to take the work that we did inside the academy and take it outside the ivory tower and really engage the public. And I have found that to be a very re rewarding experience for me. And I hope these answers are not going on too long. <laughs> no, no, this is great. This is really, this is really fascinating. And and you know, I have to, you know, what one of the things that you said is fascinating to me most. I think many people who study history, um, who do history graduate studies, do that in preparation for going to law school. I don't think most people mentally prepare to go to law school to then turn around and do no. graduate study in history. <laughs> right. Yeah. I think so you got good it, advice, maybe. Yeah, and I and I and like I said, I'm glad that I was willing to listen to you know the encouragement of especially the that one mentor of. Uh, Mr. James J. James A. Parker, um, he really encouraged it. And I have just found uh, my professional life to have been one very rewarding. I mean, my time in the classroom was a, a very rewarding experience for me. We, you know, I feel like I get, um, I have the opportunity. Well, first I'll say this, I feel like I have the best job on, on the planet, you know, because I get, not only am I working with a great group of people who have a passion for history, but I get to do history, you know, on a daily basis, even in this administrative role that I find myself in now, there's a history component to it in some form of fashion. And so it makes it easy to get up in the morning. I mean, it makes it exciting to get up in the morning and see, OK, what are we going to discover today? What will we be involved? How can I continue to help people who are out there doing history, which I think is important for building a sense of identity uh, for us as individuals and collectively, you know, how can I support the good work that people are doing across the state of North Carolina? Yeah, no, that's a good point. It, it, in my time here, I've seen uh, natural and cultural resources actively has a role in so much uh, history going on. And like you say, practicing history, not just talking about it or just reading about it, but actually, uh, actually doing it, which is yes. uh, not something you always get to do when you're uh, in the classroom or when you're, as you've been uh, in the administration. Absolutely, absolutely. So all in all, it, it's fun. So I'm having a good time. <laughs> well, that's good. Um, like I said, we're glad to have you here. Um, folks, our viewers may also know you from, uh, you have a radio show, podcast. You wanna tell us a little bit about that? And, you know, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, you know, yep, the Waters and Harvey show, which um, I, 
and I'm trying to remember, I think we started that show back in 2014. Um, we, I, in fact, I was on the phone just last night with uh, my co-host, who was one of my colleagues at UNC Asheville. And, you know, Zoom, I guess one of the benefits of, you know, if we can find a silver lining in the whole COVID, it, uh, this whole COVID experience, it's been that we found ways to kind of connect, to continue to connect, to do work like the Waters and Harvey Show, which is broadcast on Blue Ridge Public Radio in uh, Asheville, North Carolina, which is the NPR station there, and also podcast it. So you can get it, you know, Apple, I, what is it, you know, Apple Podcast and Google Play, you know, NPR One app carries the show. Marcus and I, you know, Dr. Marcus Harvey is my co host. We were talking about this last night, um, Joe. We just recorded show 96. I mean, we've had, so we're almost to 100 shows. And we talked about how, you know, fun it is just to be in conversation. But the show was really, the idea behind the show was driven by this desire really to connect with the public and not to keep what we do inside the academy at the time as a member of UNC Asheville, of the faculty there, not to keep what we had to ourselves, but find a way to talk to a broader public. And so we just had this idea, we went and we talked to the, uh, the general manager at one of the low power radio stations in Asheville. I had grown up listening to this radio station as a kid. And so I knew the general manager, he knew my parents, and he said, oh, absolutely, we'll give it a try. So we did the show there at WRES, I think, for maybe two years. And then there was an interest in bringing it to Blue Ridge Public Radio. But Marcus and I, you know, it focuses on really stories, largely stories of marginalized groups like African-Americans, Native Americans. Um, we tell, you know, try to focus on what is going on in, our, in the Latino community. Um, but it tells broader stories as well. We've had the opportunity to interview people like, um, like David Blight. I mean, which was one of the most interesting conversations that we've had on the show. Um, I think you and I were talking just before we went live in this show about uh, one show that Marcus and I did recently with Mitch Landrew, the former mayor of New Orleans, who's now leading some national work, I think in, in the Biden administration. But we had a very interesting conversation, uh, hour long conversation with Mitch and talking about the work that they were doing in Louisiana, which, as you know, I was just down in New Orleans last week for a conference and, you know, kind of seeing some of the results of the work that um, that Mitch and many, many of the people like Wynton Marcellus, who worked with him on that work, were able to do around public history in New Orleans. It was just, it was interesting to connect that with what we had talked to him about with the show. But we love doing the show. And, you know, like I said, you can get it, you know, just about anywhere. And so I hope, you know, we'll gain some more listeners from talking about it briefly here. <laughs> no, that's great. I hope folks will tune in. Um, it's a great show and I, and I love the variety of uh, material that you cover and, you know, the, sort of like this, you know, what one, uh, one is never the same as the next. And that's probably exactly. And as you know, one of the big things probably, and I have to mention this, you know, uh, my co-host, Dr. Harvey, and I'm a jazz, I'm a jazz fan, but he's a jazz aficionado. He is really into jazz. He knows it. Um, I know enough about jazz to get myself in trouble if I get into a conversation with a real expert on it. But we have recently worked with a local band there. In fact, a couple of, uh, in Asheville, in fact, a couple of the members of this band, the, the band is called The Core. Really good group. You, you know, anyone who's interested in good jazz music, you want to look up The Core. But they wrote the theme, they provided the theme music for the Waters and Harvey show. And a couple of those band members are a part of the traveling band for Michael Blubley. And so these are really talented guys. And so we had a great conversation with them not too long ago uh, as when we rolled out the new theme music for the Waters and Harvey show. And just talking about the history of jazz, talking about how jazz in America is di different from jazz in places like Europe. And, um, and one of the members of the band uh, who was also a fellow faculty member at UNC Asheville, 
uh, Dr. Bill Barris, you know, he made the point that jazz should be seen as kind of this ongoing conversation. So it was, you know, I just bring up that show because it was probably one, another one of those very fun shows. So I think, you know, the Watterson Harvest Show is fun to do because it just, you know, it just across the board, we're talking about so many different things. That's really cool. And your experience with that, with your bringing your show to life sort of sounds, you know, reminiscent of our experience bringing uh, this show to life we realized that we were doing interesting work and talking with people and, and putting out material in uh, the historical review or in some of our other publications. And there's a, there are a lot of things competing for people's attention. You know, how do you, mm -hmm. unless you subscribe to the North Carolina Historical Review or know to look for it, um, you know, how can we make sure to get these stories out in front of people? And we thought right. uh, that this would be a, a good venue and, and we're grateful for everybody who, uh, who watches and shares this. Um, and you, know, you know, I, and I could say there uh, uh, one thing uh, about, you know, it, you know, as a professor, and I enjoy, enjoyed my time as, as a professor. I mean, I, one of the things that's been rewarding about the, the job has been going out to some of our state historic sites. Um, one in particular, um, at Charlotte Hawkins Brown, one of my former students at UNC Asheville is now one of the interpreters there. And, and we were there not too long ago uh, with a group uh, from the William Friday Fellowship, uh, the current class. They spent an entire day at one of our state historic sites at Charlotte Hawkins Brown. It was a very moving, moving experience for them. But I was just so excited to see one of my former students who she really was. You know, I had some great students. I mean, there's something Joe, I'll say, you know, that's magical about being in the classroom, teaching students and then watching the light bulb go off in their head. Um, there's, you know, you just get, you get jazzed up about that. But then to go see her now working at the Charlotte Hawkins Brown site and just seeing her passion for the work that she's doing, it just, you know, it just kind of adds to, you know, that kind of extra oomph that you need on a daily basis because you just see people just connecting. Right. And so, you know, thinking about what you said about the creation of this show and being able to connect with a larger public, um, sometimes, you know, people, this is, this is going to be, this, you know, people are gonna connect with historical re related work in this way more so than they will probably will in a classroom. So I think that it's fundamentally important to find these new mediums to, to actually engage audiences, because I find that people everywhere love history, just about everywhere you go, someone will, you know, they've got a story and they want to talk about something, people love it. And I think that it, the more that we can talk about more stories, um, I think it, it gives us the possibility of creating greater understanding among different groups, if, if that makes sense. So I think that there's just so many possibilities of what we can do through mediums like this and even the historic review. Yeah, no, I'm, and this is always, you know, uh, I recall from my little time in the classroom, uh, it's always, it's nice to be able to do this kind of work because it it's a, a tangible reminder that the good practice of history is not about remembering dates. It's not about, you know, preparing for the, for the uh, test at the end of the semester. It really is about stories. It's really about connecting with, uh, um, you know, the things that landed us where we are today and right. that the things that, that happened to people at some point in the past, the changes that occurred over time shape our experiences today. And hopefully, Absolutely. uh, or one way or another can shape our experiences in the future too. There, there, there are a couple of things that you said there, if I could just comment, comment on that, just kind of remind me of a couple of things where you talked about, you know, history is more than just preparing for a test, knowing dates and knowing names and things like that. It's more than that because I have had the experience of talking to, you know, people in the public and they'll ask you, you know, what do you do? And so I'm a historian. Oh, well, I was never really good at history. Yeah, I was never really good at history in school. And one of my uh, former colleagues, he's now retired, but a brilliant historian at UNC Asheville, and some in the audience may know his name, Dr. William Spellman, Bill Spellman. 
But um, to see him give a lecture is actually a show in and of itself. You have to see him give a lecture. But he, he did say, he said, you know, he grew up thinking that history was name, rank, and serial number. Right. You know? But, you know, he came to see that it is so much more than that. It's about these stories. And as you talk about, you know, hearing the stories of other people, you know, I'm reminded of, you know, and, and in, in a way, this statement uh, by one historian who's no longer living, Winthrop Jordan, in his book, uh, White Over Black, which is one of those books that all of us have had, especially those of us who are professionally trained as historians have had to engage. When I was reading the preface of that book, there was a statement that he made in it where he said he he was haunted by this idea of how it is we actually engage the historical past, or better yet, how we read the past. Do we read it forward or do we read it backwards? And I would remember starting my, my classes out with that statement because I think that it, you know, as a historian, we, we have to challenge ourselves to read history forward. Right, because mm -hmm. all of the outcomes, the people who are going through it can't necessarily see what it is. And I think, I think, Joe, if we can do that, if we can do that more, and, and not just as professional historians, but as as a general public, as we think about the past and some of the major challenges that we're dealing with now, I think it forces us to develop empathy. And I think that that's one of the things that's really important about the work that we do. How can and I've heard a lot of people saying a, a, a book that I'm now engaging, I haven't finished reading it, but it's by uh, the author is Sherry Turkle, I believe it's her last name, but it's called Reclaiming Conversations. And she has talked about how even in the digital age, even though we think we're more connected, that we aren't because somehow we haven't learned to develop empathy. But I think that true engagement with the past and the way that we're talking here and the way that kind of Winthorpe Jordan challenges us to do in that book, I think is part of the, is part of what is necessary to, to develop that empathy, which I think is so important for our ability to live together. So that's just my, you know, <laughs> hopefully I didn't get too preachy there, but that's my two cents worth. <laughs> no, here, here, I mean, that's, um, uh, I think that you know you mentioned your experience of of seeing your former student at, at Charlotte Hawkins Brown, and I think any of these, you know, we're for, I'm fortunate occasionally to go out and visit our historic sites too, and and to see this kind of work uh, hands on on the front line, and uh, it's those kinds of conversations that you know do spark a little joy that like hey we you know it is possible to have a meaningful dialogue, uh, mm -hmm. um, and not just you know, short quips, which seem to be so much of communication lately, at least if you pick up your phone, it's right, right, you know, right. How right. much can we, how much can we throw at each other in, in 300 characters or, or whatever it is these days? Mm. Um, but yeah, that, that personal engagement and, and real deep communication that takes place in person, I think is really right. helpful. And it, you know, it, it, technology it. like this these days, I think helps facilitate that too. Um, I could, you know, I could riff off of any of these things for uh, <laughs> forever. I would, I'll probably have to ask you to come back sometime because I want to talk more about uh, your research on the black experience of people in the mountains and in Southern Appalachia, because that I think is, uh, I find that fascinating. Oh, and, yes. Uh, underexplored. But um, I'm curious, you know, you've been with the agency now for just about a hundred days, or maybe a little more than a hundred days. That seems to be like, you know, the the uh, milestone that everyone has to reach, and you have to like work okay, the first hundred days. So, um, can you tell us a little bit about your first hundred days? You know, what you uh, what you've seen, what you've learned. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess one of the first things uh, there, Joe, is that. Maybe I'm doing okay because you guys have not kind of ushered me out of the building yet, you know. So, <laughs> but not that I, not that I was expecting that, but you know, jo all joking aside, I think it's been, like I said earlier, it's been eye opening. Um, I think that uh, 
so much of what goes on here in the department and in the Office of Archives and History uh, specifically, I just wasn't aware of, right? Um, I have been, I think I've been connected with the department in some form of fashion, formally and informally for many years now, since probably the mid 1990s when I started doing my own family genealogical research because I would come here to the building here on Jones Street, you know, go into the archives and, you know, digging around documents. And I love, I love, you know, just the opportunity to, um, to look at those old documents, you know, just, it's just something about that experience. Um, I also served on the highway marker uh, advisory uh, committee. And so did that for, I think three, maybe four years that I was on as a member of that, that was fun to, to engage that process, engaging other historians across the state uh, for that. You know, and you, now you go out and you see, you know, the work that you are involved in as you drive across the state of North Carolina in, in these different communities. And then, you know, I had the opportunity to serve briefly on the North Carolina Historical Commission. So I've been involved in some way. And then the relationship that I've had with, uh, with Dr. Crow, with, with Jeffrey Crow for, for years, I felt a connection to the department that way. And, you know, I knew Michelle, Michelle Lanier. In fact, Michelle was key, who is now the head of our, you know, the, the, the director of state historic sites. Michelle connected me with a person who was very important to my own work in Asheville um, to help get my dissertation written, uh, who was Harry Harrison. And Michelle connected the two of us, and that became a key component to, to the successful completion of my dissertation about the African-American community in Asheville. But while I had those connections, just the depth of talent that's in the department, the depth of work that goes on here, I will use the word complexity as well, the complex nature of, of the work. I had no idea about that. Now, some people can hear the word complex and that, you know, sends them scurrying off into some corner somewhere. And part of the argument that I've made for a long time is that we as Americans like things to be simplified, but life is just not simple. To me, I, you know, Joe, I'm arguing for em embracing complexity, all right? So, and if you're gonna be in this job, you have to embrace the complexity. Um, I have been, been amazed by the complex nature of the work that goes on here. So thinking about the, the different people who are involved in the work. So you not only have our museums, for example, but you have, you know, friends groups that are in, involved with them. And I think that that's very in, important part. I mean, these friends groups that the ones that I've had the opportunity to, uh, members of friends groups that I've had the opportunity to meet, they're deeply dedicated to, um, to the sites that they're involved with. I just recently had that opportunity with the, the friends group at Fort Fisher, you know, answered an email yesterday from one of the members of that group. And they're deeply dedicated to the preservation of that site, which I think is important. So I have found that very rewarding. What I've tried to do too is to be in a learning mode for these past 100 days. And that learning mode will continue, I think, um, probably for much of this first year, I'll be in listening and learning mode. Um, I have been traveling across the state. That has been great to travel um, and go to these different sites. I have visited, I haven't visited all of our 27 state historic sites, but I've had the opportunity to visit many of them. I will continue to do that over the next few months, you know, once we can get started with that again. But I have been deeply, um, impressed with the dedication of the staff, you know, people like yourself. I'll say this, you know, and I don't know if Dr. Crow is actually watching this or not, but we had lunch maybe two months ago. Um, and one of the things he did tell me, he said, every deputy eventually finds a place that they really are fascinated with and they can get focused on that area. I think that he did tell me that he predicted that historical resources, which is the division that you're in, was going to probably be one of those places where I was going to become very, very interested in. He was right about that because I just think about what goes on in the 
the division that you're a part of, um, that's got, you know, the State Historic Preservation Office. And um, Ramona Bartos, who is leading that division, I mean, just a brilliant team of people who are doing absolutely remarkable work, being able to sit through the conversations about, you know, how decisions are made about the National Registry of Historic, you know, places, all of these different things. That's work that I wasn't necessarily familiar with. I knew that it happened, but the process that we go through, I think I've learned a lot about that. State archaeology, you know, the work that's going on there. So Joe, you know, not long before, you know, uh, shortly after I got here, I had the opportunity to go out back in the back of our building with the, the staff from the archaeology office because of the development of this new park, Freedom Park, that's being developed and watch them, you know, they let me use the ground uh, penetrating radar, you know, to kind of look, that was absolutely just uh, so much fun to do. Um, so I've learned just, you know, just how much work is going on here in the department. It's also made me think about the historical profession itself. Many people know that not a heck of a lot of jobs in the on the academic side right now. Um, I'm just returning from uh, the annual conference for the American Historical Association, which took place down in, um, in New Orleans last week. And one of the things that people are talking about is the lack of real jobs. Although there's you know, a number of people who are interested in going into the profession, one of the concerns is, are, will there be jobs? I'm finding, at least I believe from what I see so far, that there's a lot of opportunity in the public sphere um, of what you can do with a history degree. And so I've been amazed by that. Um, I've been traveling with our head of, of with the head of uh, our museum division um, and going to our state museums uh, and visiting the staff there and looking at what they're thinking about for the future and what they would like to see. I think that there's a commitment among the staff here to really diversify our stories, to bring more stories um, to the foreground, stories that may have been you know, some that have been marginalized in the past, but to bring those stories to the foreground, to really engage new audiences. And I'm deeply committed to trying to support that work and helping to, to support that work as we move along. I mean, what you all are doing in historic publications with, you know, with the historical review, which I've had the opportunity to publish in, I think that that work is, is so fundamentally important. Um, and so much good material that comes out of the historical review. Um, I mentioned the highway marker program, which I think is just another important piece of work that happens there. I think as I sat down, you know, in a conversation with you and your team, and we talk about the things that you all are doing there. I mean, uh, Chris Minkins and the work that he's doing on his side. I just find it, it's just incredible work. And I think it's gonna continue to, I don't wanna say complicate, but in some ways it will complicate the narrative. It's gonna complicate the narrative. But again, there, I think that that's a good thing. Um, it really keeps life interesting, these, these, complex, these complexities that we're finding. And so I have been deeply, uh, I've been deeply impressed by that and know that I will continue to be as I continue to get out and engage the, uh, the staff and the team that's, that's a part of this department. Well, I'll, I'll be happy to set up a desk here for you if you want okay. to <laughs> really do history with us. We will we'll take your help. Um, I, you know, I think for the benefit of our, of our viewers, I should, we should point out that the Office of Archives and History includes um, state historic sites, historical resources, which is what you just mentioned, you know, archaeology, historic preservation, uh, publications, um, State archives. Um, what am I leaving? In state museums. State, yes, state oh. archives and records. State museums. Um, state historic sites. Twenty seven. And 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 Joe, I will say this: what I have found. So you know, I'm engaging engaging my my counterparts in other states, right? I you know had the opportunity to go out to Denver not too long ago to meet with a group of state historic administrators. The state state historic administrators meeting, which it was. Um, there were, I guess, about 24, 23 or 24 of us there. So not all 50 states were there. That still has a lot to do with the whole COVID issue. But of those who were there, I came away 
very impressed by North Carolina's commitment, the state's commitment to historic preservation and to history. Um, it seems that North Carolina has one of the most comprehensive approaches to how we do public history through our public museums, through the state historic sites, through state historic publications, archeology, span state um, historic preservation office, uh, archives and records. I think it's very comprehensive. And I think that that speaks to the state of North Carolina and the citizens of the state of North Carolina and their commitment to, to the importance of history. I mean, I'm one of those people who's out there saying history does matter. It really does matter. And so I think that North Carolina is demonstrating that it believes that as well through the comprehensive nature of, of, just, of just the Office of Archives and History itself. Yeah, no, that's a that's a good observation. My, from from what I've seen, we have uh, there's a short list of, of peer organizations in other states that are quite as comprehensive as we are. Other mm. states carve things up much differently, and they really do. It's, it's nice to be able to uh, uh, to work so closely with folks in both archives and museums and sites, and that we can. It makes it easier to make things happen, I think. So that's right, a, it does. That's a good thing. And there's a and there's a lot of good collaboration that goes on across the department. And I know that people are looking for more ways to do that. And so um, it, it, I find that you know, if I could use one word, it would be the word dynamic. It's very dynamic here. You know, there's a, a lot of dynamic, a lot of dynamic things that are happening. And I guess it's okay for me to, to say this you know, thinking about the most recent state budget. I mean, the most recent state budget had significant commit commitments to um, the work of historic preservation across the state of North Carolina. And I'm deeply appreciative of that. And I know I don't speak, that's not me speaking along. I think it's um, the members of this entire team that we're deeply appreciative of, of the state's commitment to this work. Yeah, I'm grateful that we're able to do the work that we can do with the support. Um, have you, uh, what are some surprises or unexpected things that you've seen over, well, I don't want to get you in trouble or anyone no. else, but, uh, <laughs> are, are there any, have you had any surprises or, or unexpected things other than the complexity in a good way yeah, of what we're doing? I think, you know, some of the things that we, we have to, to think about, I mean, um, obviously the COVID, COVID related issues, you know, I was dealing with that at the university level as well. And, you know, we're dealing with it here. It's so multi-layered here because in different places, you know, different things gonna happen. You know, I, um, and that's not necessarily a surprise so much as just, just one of those things you just, I've had to engage um, and be in those conversations. I think everybody is exhausted of issues around COVID, but it's just there. Um, I'm not, I'm not surprised by the enthusiasm and commitment that I've witnessed uh, across the state um, of people who work, who work for the Office of Archives and History in these multiple divisions. I mean, there's a lot of enthusiasm. So I'm not surprised by that. I am, I think I'm heartened by it. One thing that I don't want us to ever do is to take advantage of that enthusiasm. I want to make sure that people, that there are opportunities for the people who work in the division for professional development, you know, that, that we're making sure that people are compensated for the work that they actually do, you know. I, um, you know, I, it's just, a, I think, Joe, more than anything, anything, probably the conversations that I've had with folks. I didn't think about one of the first places that I went, let's, if we talk about historic sites. The first site that I visit, visited in this capacity to actually talk to staff there was the state capitol, um, the state capitol building. And to be able to engage that team and hear from them about their experiences of being in that space in the most recent protest that we had and, and hearing how that experience was for them, I think I was surprised by the impact, the depth of the impact on them as part of the staff there having to work and be in the space at that time. It, that surprised me, um, but it just also opened up the opportunity for deeper conversations, right? And I think 
and uh, and to let people across the state know that this is you know that um I mean, it's, you know, it's important to hear those stories uh, itself. And so I've been surprised by that. Um, there's nothing that has shocked me, I don't think. I think when you think about uh, all of the rules and regulations that we have to follow, all of these laws, I, you know, I have to think about that, that stuff in a very different way now. I, I didn't really have to think about it beforehand, but I have to think about it now thinking about the administrative code and what does the administrative code allow us to do? What does it not allow us to do? So those things have been surprising to me, but again, it makes the job interesting. All right. So, so I, I will say that um, I'm sure that there are probably going to be some other things out there that I'm going to find surprising. I mean, there's, there are often some challenges that go on at some of the sites that teams have to actually deal with, you know, when they're dealing with the public um, and making sure that they feel supported when they're doing that work, I think is, is important. But the, I, I guess I would list those as some of the surprises. No, that makes sense. Well, and not just, you know, in addition to dealing with the public, our, our colleagues at sites have to also deal with uh, managing and maintaining historic properties that are, you know, sometimes hundreds of years old and, and yes. uh, face the, the perils that that any old things face as I'm right. reminded every day as I get older. <laughs> um, <laughs> you all are. And I think, you know, and there again, Joe, you make a point that I think is very, a very important point that you made that, you know, it's one thing to sit in a classroom to read about, you know, things that happened in the past, but it's a very different thing to be able to go to a site and actually see it, touch it, smell it, feel it, I mean, it adds an extra, it adds another dimension to it. So I think maintaining these spaces is, is fundamentally, it's important. I think that, um, you know, I'm often, I quote people all the time, you know, one of the people that I've been, and, and this is paraphrasing him really, and it is uh, Edmund Burke, that Burke, you know, kind of made this statement that the world belongs to the living, the dead, and those yet to come. That's a paraphrase of what he actually said but what he was saying is that our social order is an ongoing process. It's not ever over. And so there's this conversation that goes on across generations, those who have left and they've left us this inheritance, you know, what do we do to kind of continue to maintain it, to change it where it needs to be changed and then pass it on to those who are going to come behind us. I think is important and it's the reason why I see the preservation of these historic sites very important. I, I, I you know, I could sit here and talk about all of the sites that I've been to. Um, I mean, you, you can't help but be very enthused and come away. The, the enthusiasm is infectious when you go down to Triumph Palace and you meet some of the members of the Friends team or the foundation that has been involved in that work and they see why it's important to their community. You get the same feel when you go to Alamance Battleground. You know, when I went there for the opening up of their trail, they now have a trail that they have developed, which I think is, that's another place where I think uh, there's great opportunity here in the in the department because it includes natural resources. You know, our historic sites are, they're not only historic sites, uh, but state parks are historic sites as well. And the historic sites are state parks. And, you know, I'm stealing that from one of the, the members of, uh, of the state historic uh, sites team in Kimberly Floyd, who's up at, um, advanced birthplace in Western North Carolina, but they really are. You can go to these places and you get to enjoy the great outdoors, which I think is very important. And these places have a history. And so I, again, I, I can't advocate enough for the importance of pre preserving these different sites. Yeah, it's, you know, it's kind of a, a paraphrase of the um, historian Francis Parkman, who, who more or less said, you have to read about a place and then you have to go to a place and then you can come back and write about a place. There you go. Or the thing, you know, and, and there's real truth in that, you know, uh, uh, going to get your feet on the ground and, and uh, it really changes your perspective of things that you maybe have read about or heard about or stories that you were told. And then you, you finally go visit a place and it's like, whoa, um, it's, yeah. it's much, 
it's you know it really changes uh, your perspective in a good way. And it makes me think about uh, again here, Joe. You ask me about surprises. I will bring up you know another very rewarding experience for me. Um, rewarding and moving was to go to Stagville, you know, and the team there, Vera, who's there, um, that entire team, um, and their dedication to the site. But what I think I was amazed by is just to hear the story of how the African American community there in Durham County, you know, some who are descendants of enslaved people from that site are very actively engaged with the site. Um, that's not something that I expected to see. I mean, given you know some of the complex conversations that we're having about this historical uh, past and what and how and what it means and the trauma of it. But this, you know, Stagville is a place where many uh, members of the African American community, those who are descended from uh, enslaved people at that site, you know, find there's something about that engagement with the site. And, and I think that that's, that that's worthy of a larger conversation. And I love to be in conversation with some of the members of, of those families and to talk with them. So I, I found that, you know, very eye-opening and surprising and it deepened the experience of going out to actually visit Stagville. For sure. Um, we got a question from one of our viewers and I just, I don't, we'll ask this and I, I think I may have one follow-up question, but the question is, uh, how did you get started? In, uh, with just history or just with this job? Um, Let's go with history. You know, I'm, I'm going to credit that to, you know, I've mentioned here my, my, my mentor, Jay Parker, but it actually started before then. You know, my, my grandfather on the water side of the family, uh, Edgar Waters Sr. was born in 1897. And so he didn't get married until he's like 42 years old. And then, you know, then he had 10 children, right? So my father is the oldest, is the oldest of the 10. So I had the great fortune of knowing my, my grandfather. Um, and I spent a lot of time with him. I was his second, the second of like, I think 27 grandchildren in on the water side of the family, but I was the second, my brother being the first, but I spent a lot of time with my grandfather and it was, I think I was fascinated by the stories that he would tell me, you know, and what he had seen. So I think that I got my passion for history developed there. I think it was reinforced by my other grandfather, Isaiah Rice. And in fact, as you know, um, Joe, there's been a lot of work in Western North Carolina out in Asheville around my grandfather, Isaiah Rice, who was born 1917, World War II veteran, um, developed a passion for photography. We published an essay about my grandfather in Southern cultures um, not too long ago, because over the course of his lifetime, we don't know where he developed this skill for photography. But you know, if I have all of his, I have all of his cameras, but one, Joe. Um, my mother gave me all of his cameras, with the exception of one, which is this little spy camera, which looks like a pack of gum. She won't give me that one just yet. It's the one I really want. But he would drive around, and he would just take pictures. And many of them are candid photos. Some of them are, you know, specific photos. But it's one of the largest, we discovered that it's one of the largest collections of an urban African-American community in Southern Appalachia that exists. Um, nearly 2,000 photos in that collection. My mother allowed UNC Asheville to digitize that, that collection. It has been used by a number of people here for some projects here in the department, the Green Book Project, which was done by the African-American Heritage Commission. Um, they were able to use some of the, photo, the photos that's in that collection, you know, which dates from the late 1940s all the way up to 1980 when he, when he passed away. But just being involved in that work, I think, and watching him, I think, even early on, because he used to take these photographs, many of them were done in slides, and then would bring the community together and actually show the slides on a projector. So I remember him doing some of these things growing up. All of that to me, you know, um, Joe speaks of, of history work, 
It's, it's got a history component. So I think that that's what kind of helped me develop the passion for it. Then meeting people like John Hope Franklin, Jeffrey Crow, Dr. Jeffrey Crow, uh, my relationship with Dr. James Crisp, Jim Crisp at, um, at North Carolina State University who helped guide my research uh, there. And then the work that I did with Harry Watson over at, at Chapel Hill, it just kind of kept reinforcing this kind of passion and interest. So I am, all I'm, although I'm doing a lot of administrative work now, I still have an opportunity. I think it, it in some ways feeds even the intellectual interest that I continue to have in the historical profession. So I would look at, you know, look at those relationships with my early on with my grandparents as, as being kind of feeders of my interest in this work. That's terrific. Yeah, that sounds that sounds familiar. <laughs> I think I got my uh, interest in history of my grandfather's knee. Um, I sort of have one last question, and I, I think we're running short on time here. But um, the it's not. I know it's not profitable for for historians to try to predict the future, but. Um, we have two milestones coming up. This year is um, our agency's 50th anniversary. And um, in just about two years, the North Carolina Historical Review will be 100 years old, which is uh, an amazing feat that we are, we are in a, a very small cohort of very old journals at this point, the state historical journals. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with these milestones in mind, what do you see as the um, important work? What do you see as the challenges? I, I don't know. You know, what do you what do you think about the future when it comes to uh, um, the kind of work that we're doing here? Sure. I, again, it, it, your question prompts in my mind. You know, earlier point that both you and I made about the comprehensive approach that North Carolina has taken to, you know history and importance of the historical past. Um, I hope that we'll continue to build upon that. Um, you and I have had conversations. I mean, you, let me just say about the historical review, a uh, hundred years old. I mean, people should go, if they have an opportunity, just go back and just read through. I mean, the archive is there. You can access, I don't know how many of those publications um, are the issues have been digitized yet. I mean, you would have to tell me uh, Joe, but they're accessible. There's many fascinating articles in there. One that um, that Dr. Crow had us read um, when I was in one of his classes, which you know kind of just sparked my interest, was on a man, the life of John Crow the Stanley, who was an African American man from uh, Craven County. And I just recently asked you to get me a copy of that again because I want to share it with someone. It's just a fascinating story. Um, even my own piece, my, my piece that was published in there a few years ago, I think in 2017, time passes too quickly because it just seems like yesterday, but I was able to publish a piece, uh, an essay in there on um, the Young Men's Institute, uh, or the YMI Cultural Center in Asheville, North Carolina, which had this unique a founding relationship with George Vanderbilt and the Biltmore State, and there's been an ongoing relationship there. This was an organization that he created for the African American community in Asheville. So the historic review is kind of uncovering all of these little nuggets, and and they're not, you know, I'm just using that kind of uh, maybe as a metaphor, you know, uh, these um, nuggets because they're actually big big uh, stories that, that you're uncovering, but they're largely stories that people don't know anything about sometimes. And so I think the more we can build an audience uh, to continue to build the audience for the historical review, I think is important. And I'm deeply committed to working to do that with you. It's an opportunity, I think, for many um, people who are looking for the opportunity to publish, to publish uh, their work and especially on, well, specifically on, on topics related to North Carolina, 
it's an important uh, venue to actually do that. Um, it was important to me as a professor who was working towards tenure. Um, it played an important role in helping me get tenure. <laughs> so I think looking for opportunities to engage the, the review, if, you, if people out there are looking for opportunities to do that, not only as a reader, but as a writer, they should do that. That work should continue um, because who knows what more stories we're going to uncover. Um, and the department itself, I think just, just this deep commitment that the state has made to preserving, to preservation, I think is just fundamentally important. So this is wonderful to think about 50 years of, of a state commitment to historic preservation across the board. I think it's just, it's, it's fabulous work. And I'm happy and again, happy and deeply honored and privileged to be a part of that work. Well, we're glad to have you. And I'm not going to I'm not going to skip an opportunity to you, you open the door to put in a pitch for the historical review as well. Um, anyone watching the uh, the historical review, the older issues up through uh, probably the 60s or 70s are maybe later than that. I, the, I should know the specific date, but I'm embarrassed that I can't recall it right now. Um, are on the state archives, they're digitized on the state archives digital um, um, portal. They're, the remainder up to the fairly recent past are available on JSTOR, which you can get through your local library, or if you have a state library card, um, you can access it through um, using that. If you don't have a state library card, you should contact the state library and get one because it's a really Absolutely. valuable Absolutely. Um, resource. It, it, and Joe, just one last word from me here for this time, you know, I didn't talk that much about uh, Sarah Kuntz, who serves as the state archivist and, and her team in archives and records. But there, I, you know, she recently gave me kind of a, the tour. But I did tell Sarah when I started the job, one of the first things I wanted to do was to go behind the door in the state archives. I wanted to see in the stacks. And so I've been looking forward to that for a long time, like a little kid in a candy store. So that was fun. But that whole team there, the work that's going on around oral histories and the collection of oral histories, you know, just deeply, deeply fasc fascinating work and seeing the work that they do around preservation, even of old documents and what is preserved and how they go about doing that work for me has been fascinating and um, deeply engaging, you know, uh, uh, conversations and work to just to just view and, and just see. Yeah, it's it's great stuff. And and I too, one of the first things I did when I started was like, can I get behind the door? <laughs> <laughs> it was very cool. <laughs> I mean, it's boxes, but it was very cool. It is because as a patron, as a patron, you know, you don't get the, you don't get that opportunity to go behind that door. And so, I was looking uh, forward to the opportunity to go back there. I got it, and so um, you know, just seeing all that you know that's back there, um, and we need to think about space, you know, because we oh, right. continue to collect more of this material. And I know this one of the conversations that we're involved in. Where do we continue to kind of archive this material because it will be important to future generations. That's right. Well, and I think, especially over the past uh, past two years, as many of us have been spending more time at home and we see all the things that we've collected, like what do I do with my photos and books and things like this? And then when you consider that the state archives is responsible for managing that task for the entire state and all of state government, it, I don't, oh, I don't, I wouldn't know where to start. So I, my hat's off to them. It is, it is. I mean, there, there clearly is, it's a special field. It's a specialized field because this is, you know, and trying to understand all of that. I think, you know, ooh, it could take years trying to understand, you know, just that whole process, but yes, yeah. wonderful, wonderful team. Well, um, I'm going to give you the opportunity to, to have the last word. So, uh, um, well, you know, not that I, you know, haven't I had enough words, Joe? <laughs> but no, it's just been fun to just engage in this conversation with you. I hope that, you know, it contains something that was meaningful to those who are watching. Um, I again want to say that I do feel a deep, deep, uh, uh, sense of honor uh, to be in this position to serve as the deputy secretary to work with you all 
to work with just a fascinating team and to be kind of a cheerleader. And I hope that that this conversation has helped me fulfill that role in some form of fashion. So, but that that would be my last word. And again, I guess my, my last two words would be this, history does matter. That's a, that's a great sentiment to end on. Uh, Dr. Darren Waters, thank you for joining me today. And for all our viewers, uh, we'll be back again uh, this time next month with another conversation. Thanks. All right. Thank you.